Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I am so, so happy to be here. I can't even tell you how much so. I've been coming to Portland in and out since about 2007, uh, ministering at different churches and doing some stuff on the prophetic and also on dreams. And uh, we prayed, a friend of mine and I prayed for a long time, friends of mine and I prayed a long time just for this particular opportunity, just really believing that God was in God's heart. So, so excited to be here. Um, I wanted to just introduce a little bit about how I got into dreams because um, it was interesting as I was talking to some of the staff before coming in, sort of one of things I, I heard was like, you know, it's not often that you get to hear something like totally brand new, like, you know, in church, and that for many of the people here, speaking on dreams is, would be brand new. And so I want to do just a little bit of introduction around my own testimony around them, and, uh, and we'll start that way. So I uh, have dreamt all my life. Um, I have interpreted dreams for myself uh, most of my life. I remember when I was about 10, 11 years old, um, you know, just starting to really dream a lot and it happened before that but it was around 10 or 11 when I started interpreting and I would come down from have uh, from sleep and go into the kitchen and I would hang out with my mom and I would say mom I had this dream last night and I think maybe God is speaking to me and I would tell her the dream and I would tell her my interpretation and I grew up in a Christian family but not in a tradition where people would really acknowledge you know dreams and the possibility of God speaking and it was just amazing because even though she didn't understand it, she was so open and she just encouraged me like, you know what, I think that's God. And so gratefully, I grew up in a home that just acknowledged that. Well, as I got closer to Jesus, as I got older, um, I started having more dreams. I started having prolific dreams that were super, super long. And what once was readily understood, now all of a sudden, I didn't understand. And I believe that the reason for that is because God really wanted me to study the word. <laughs> And he kind of lifted that natural ability, or well, really a spiritual ability to, to hear him and understand. He lifted that off of me so that I would go to the Word and study. And so I did. And that took me, obviously, into the Bible to understand dreams and visions. It also took me to an amazing ministry um, called Streams Ministries. And that's where I met one of my spiritual fathers. His name is John Paul Jackson. He's no longer with us, but he um, was really a pioneer in being able to release to the church about dreams and hearing God through dreams and how to interpret and so um, I was just so blessed by, by that whole season of my life. And all of a sudden, what I found was, not only was I able to interpret more and more of my, of my dreams, but now God started using me to interpret the dreams of others. And in particular, what was amazing is, um, as I met people of different spiritual backgrounds, so not just people in church, but people outside the four walls of the church. And in fact, the first class that I took, I heard all these amazing testimonies about how people were doing prophetic evangelism, and they were going to Barnes and Noble bookstores and festivals, and they were interpreting dreams, and I heard these amazing testimonies, and I was like, oh my gosh, God. I want to do that. <laughs> I want to do that. And so a lot of where I cut my teeth being able to interpret dreams was out there. And so um, I want to start tonight uh, in Job 33, 14 to 17. So if you'd open your Bibles with me, that would be great. For God may speak. I'm in Job 33, verse 14. For God may speak in one way or in another. Yet man does not perceive it. In a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falls upon men, and obviously you know women as well, while slumbering on their beds, then he opens the ears of men and he seals their instruction in order to turn man from his deed and conceal pride from man. And I don't have this up on the slide, but I'm gonna continue into verse 18. He keeps back his soul from the pit and his life from perishing by the sword. That's a really, really powerful verse. And I know when I first started studying dreams, I would meet people in church who kind of thought I was a little weird <laughs> and didn't really think that what I was doing was biblical and was a little bit worried about me. And I was so grateful that I had this verse. Because <laughs> here's the thing. 
when it says God may speak in one way or another in a dream or a vision of the night, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. (laughs) What he did then, he's still doing now, and he will still continue to do. And so um, I'm so grateful that I, that, you know, just that, that, that putting, that when people put that in me, the certainty that what I was doing was biblical, and I really hope that, that tonight that is um, what this is all about for you. I want to start, though, by sharing a couple of testimonies, and here's why. Um, in a lot of places where I travel, I will be speaking about dreams for the first time, but sometimes where I travel, um, there are churches that are totally flowing in the spirit, they're fully on board with dreams and really love dreams, and yet what I find is that they pretty much only value the dreams that come from God and they only want to interpret the dreams that come from God. And the Bible teaches us, actually, that um, dreams, I'm going to go to my next slide, not that do all dreams come from God. No, not all dreams come from God. The Bible shows us that there are three sources of dreams. We can receive God dreams that come from God. We can receive dreams that come from the enemy. And we also can receive dreams that come from the influence of our own soul. I obviously just read Job 33. It's clearly, God speaks. If you look to that other one, Zechariah 10, that talks about false dreams. Where do false things come from? The enemy. <laughs> And then when you look in Jude, it talks about our soul, being able to receive things through our soul, through our dreams. So not all dreams are from God. However, what I have found is that all interpretations belong to God. And when we turn our hearts to the Lord, regardless of the types of dreams that we have, we can have the Holy Spirit speak to us about them. And it's amazing. So I want to encourage you, or I want to present to you, just the possibility that we want to turn to the Holy Spirit for all dreams. In Genesis 40, we're told that all interpretations belong to God. That's Joseph speaking to Pharaoh. And he doesn't just say that he only has interpretations for the dreams that come from God, or excuse me, that God only has interpretations for the dreams that come from him, but that he has interpretations for all dreams. So, I find myself at a dream party. What's a dream party? I was asked, amazingly, I was living in uh, somewhere over in the south, I think it was Tennessee. I was asked by someone to go over to England. They flew me from where I was living over to England to do a dream party. What they wanted to do is they wanted to have a whole bunch of their friends who were interested in spirituality but really did not want to go to church. And what they did is we had a party and about first 45 minutes was just hanging out with each other and then all of a sudden we sat down and they said, hey, this is our friend Janine. She has, um, you know, was here to talk to us about our dreams and uh, she's gonna interpret if you guys would like for her tonight. So I give a little bit of introduction the way I did with you. First dream that came up that night was a very powerful dream. And this is a dream that is from the enemy, but it is a dream that I hope as you hear the story, you will see the value of interpreting all dreams, regardless of whether they come from God, the enemy, or your own soul. This is her dream, and I'm gonna say it in the first person, because generally it's easier for you to enter into. So, she says this. So, I'm in the middle of a divorce right now, a very, very painful divorce. And I've had a repetitive dream ever since we separated, and in this dream, I'm looking into the mirror, and my husband has bitten out half of my face, and all the flesh is torn away, And I hate looking at myself in the mirror because I look ugly, I do not recognize myself, I hate what I've become. And I know that what he's done to me has made me the way that I look and I cannot stand, cannot stand seeing myself. And as she's saying this, you can feel the anger, but more than the anger, you can feel the sadness. (laughs) And so I'm asking the Holy Spirit, as she's giving me the dream, Holy Spirit, would you give me the interpretation? Would you speak to me about the symbols that are in this? Would you help me to understand them the way you speak in symbol and metaphor? And I'm going to be introducing that in just a little bit. And here's what I said to her. This dream is about you. And this dream is acknowledging that in your marriage, there were things that your husband did that tore away at your identity. So much so that when you look at yourself in the mirror, when you look at who you are now, you can't even recognize yourself. But here's the thing. I knew that the enemy wanted to keep her in that place. 
He wanted to keep her in that hopeless place of, of believing that she was ugly and that she couldn't be redeemed and everything else. And I knew that that was not God. And so I looked at her and I said this. I said, but you've been given the dream because it's to urge you to seek the healing that you need. And then I started prophesying because as you seek the healing that you need, good is gonna come from that and you are going to be able to be restored. You're gonna be able to look at yourself and not only see yourself for who you really are, but you are going to be able to celebrate the fullness of your identity. And as I said it, she was crying. Now, I don't know all that she understood from that because I don't know where she's at spiritually. And we actually never got a chance to have a conversation. But what I can tell you for sure is something was ministering to her. You could see it. You could see the Holy Spirit on her and you could see her receiving it. And I knew then, that night, the power of being able to hear the Holy Spirit for interpretations, the ability to minister the heart of God, you know, into those nightmares. So, I wanna share another story. Um, obviously, God doesn't just speak to unbelievers, he also speaks to those of us who know him and he speaks in really powerful ways. And we can have incredible, incredible dreams from God and we certainly wanna look at those too. So um, this was actually a dream that I heard at the very first dream class I ever, I ever went to. And in this dream, this woman is about, uh, she's in her late 70s, early 80s, and she's very embarrassed by this dream, but it has stuck with her. Have you ever had that experience? Like you have a dream and you do not know what it means, but you're like, gosh, I think there's something significant in it. And so she'd held on to this dream for a few years, and she shares it at this class, and she says this. So in my dream, I go to this town, and this town is absolutely beautiful. It's pristine, it's in order, all the buildings are gorgeous, all the lawns are manicured, everything is absolutely perfect, and I'm marveling at how gorgeous it is. And as I walk into the town, I realize that I'm supposed to go up to the second floor of a building. So I go in, I go up to the second floor, I'm drawn to the window, I go to the window, and as I look at the window, I'm looking at this beautiful town, and then all of a sudden, this herd of pigs, comes in and the herd of pigs ruins everything they're pooing everywhere they're peeing everywhere and she's like embarrassed by saying that but that's what they did and everything they're digging up the garden and they're you know everything is just absolute chaos and confusion and then she said um, and at this point I realize I have a machine gun now we're logical and rational, right? So she's embarrassed by the fact that she has a machine gun. She kind of steps out of the dream for a minute and she goes, I don't really own a machine gun. And you're looking at this tiny, petite, you know, eight, 78, whatever year old woman and you're like, okay, I'm pretty sure you don't. And, <laughs> and she said, and I have this machine gun and I know that I am supposed to shoot these pigs. And I know that I'm supposed to do this, but I don't want to do this because I don't want to create a bloody mess, you know? I do not want to kill these animals. I've never killed an animal in my life. But then all of a sudden, I realize I have M&Ms for bullets. And she said, oh, there's gonna be no blood. So she decides to go ahead and shoot the pigs. And sure enough, she shoots the pigs one by one by one. And every time, she said, I hit my mark. And that pig, one by one, they're all driven, all driven out of town. And then I look back at the town and I see that everything is now beautiful, everything is restored, and everything is perf in perfect order. Now, how about you? I don't know about you, but, how, but if I'd had that dream, I'm not entirely sure that I would wake up in the morning and think, oh, I, th I think I've heard from God. <laughs> because it's weird, right? But this dream was interpreted for her, and here's um, what, it's actually John Paul who interpreted it, and here's what he said. This dream is about you. And he said, and this dream is about uh, your God-given ability to look into situations and people's lives and be able to see God's original, perfect, created order. And he's also given you the ability to go up to a higher perspective, to receive his perspective as you look in on these situations. And he shows you how unclean things have come into people's lives and how it's ruined the perfect order that he created. And with the sweetness of your words, he's given you the ability to hit the mark every time, to speak into those unclean things and drive them out. And when that happens, 
his perfect, created, restored order comes to pass. And when I heard that, I was like, that is astounding. <laughs> That's astounding. I had the opportunity to hear her the next, to talk to her the next day. And I, I wanted to hear, you know, what was that like and, and what did you feel? And she said, you know, when you get to my age, you start to wonder what's the value of my life. And I've, you know, been, I've, I've, I've just been looking at other people's lives and thinking maybe my life isn't quite as good as theirs. I haven't done quite as much. I haven't gone to Africa. I haven't done this. I haven't done that. But as he was speaking that to me, I realized, oh, God's used me that way. <laughs> I've spoken words where people have said, I feel the tenderness of God piercing my heart. And I've seen how unclean things have gone out of people's lives as a result of what God has given me to pray and to minister. And she said, and I realize now, at the end of my life, I've done what God has asked me to do. <laughs> this is pretty amazing. So, when we look at dreams, there's some things that happen when we look at dreams. Going back to that first dream, why is it important to understand the dreams that we get from the enemy? We don't turn to him, obviously, for the interpretation. We look to the Holy Spirit. The enemy gives us a dream. Holy Spirit, what is it that you want to speak to me about this thing? That's exactly what happened in the first story. When we understand the enemy's plans and the way that we understand it is by seeking the wisdom of the Holy Spirit, we've received powerful revelation because we know it's going to be counter to what God has for our lives. And so we can ask the Holy Spirit for the strategy, what is it that I can do to partner with you, Holy Spirit, so that I can overcome the enemy's strategy? And the second story illustrates that dreams are an aspect of prophetic ministry. <laughs> when we seek the Holy Spirit for a dream that comes from God or a dream that comes from the soul or the enemy, we hear him, we have the ability to prophesy God's plan into their lives. That's a really powerful thing. And guess what? We can also do the same for ourselves. As we learn to interpret, we can learn how to encourage ourselves and hear the Holy Spirit for what it is that he has for us. So, for the most part, unfortunately though, in the church, we've lost our appreciation for dreams. And yet dreams are incredibly significant to God. Now why is it that I, do I say that we've lost our appreciation for dreams? Here's why. Because as I've gone through this whole walk since 2002 until now, here's what I hear from people in the church. I had this really crazy dream last night, similar probably to the one that I just shared about that woman who saw the pigs. And this is what they say. It must have been the pizza I ate. Must have been the cheese I ate. I had too much, you know. And here's why we say that. Because dreams are illogical, right? <laughs> they transcend space, time. You know, you can do things like fly. You can do things. Um, you can be a younger person than what you are now. You can go to your childhood home. They don't really make any sense. And because we don't understand them, we think that it's the pizza I ate. Why else do I say that the church has lost, its you know, has lost their appreciation for dreams? Because I've had the privilege of being on many, many, many outreaches since 2002 where we're in coffee houses or arts festivals or new age festivals. And when people find out that we're followers of Jesus and we've just interpreted their dream, they'll say, I didn't know that Christians could interpret dreams. <laughs> Which is so sad. <laughs> Look at Joseph. Look at Daniel, <laughs> that's what they did. We were known, they were known because they had the Spirit of God with them, they were known for being able to interpret dreams. And yet, right now, and it's changing, thank God, right now the church isn't necessarily known for that. How else do I think, do I sense that we've lost the significance? Well, when I go to these same festivals, usually there are other Christians there, and almost always we have one of them come up to us and say something like this, are you saved? because they see us interpreting dreams and they're not so sure those two things line up. And I'll say, yeah, and then they'll grill me. Well, do you believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins? Yes. Have you confessed it with your mouth? Yes. <laughs> do you believe that he is the only way to the Father? And they will grill me because they are absolutely certain that I don't know Jesus because I interpret dreams. So we've lost to this appreciation for dreams, even though dreams are incredibly significant to God. So let's look to the word. What does the word say? Well, 
He used the interpretation of dreams to position Daniel and Joseph in favor with pagan kings. And if we, you go to those stories and you actually look at what happened in those stories, you know, there were dreams that couldn't be understood by the popular dream interpretation methods of the day. And they caused confusion for both Nebuchadnezzar and Joseph. They wanted, meaning they were wanting to seek them out. And they looked to Joseph and Daniel. And as a result of having the correct interpretation, both Joseph and Daniel were risen to place of prominent, places of prominence and being able to speak into their lives. Let's go to another example, Gideon. Um, if you've been in church since you were a little kid, you probably have heard about Gideon and the 300, and we've talked about, you know, it's like the mighty men, and we rah, rah, rah. Well, what's incredible about that story is the Lord encounters Gideon. He comes to Gideon, and he tells him that he's going to overcome the Midianites, and then something very precious happens, and he says, if you're afraid, go down. Go down to the camp and hear something, and he goes down, he hears a dream. And in the dream, the interpretation of the dream is basically he's going to overcome the Midianites. Gideon received the encouragement that he needed through the interpretation of a dream. Pretty profound. Now then we have the life of Jesus. And this to me is so powerful. Mary, she's been visited by an angel, right? She's been told, I want to, you know, by the Lord, Will you have Jesus? I'm going to impregnate you by the Holy Spirit. She says yes to that. I've often thought, you know, what was that conversation like after she had gave the yes to the angel and after she went to Joseph? Can you imagine 13, 14-year-old Mary? Hey, Joseph. So um, an angel came and visited me last night, and now I'm pregnant. Can you imagine what that was like, hearing that from Joseph? And it's really clear in the word that Joseph was concerned, right? And he decides he's going to divorce her quietly. He doesn't want to shame her. And then something really powerful happens at night. And the Lord comes in a dream. Angel of the Lord comes and he ministers, you know. And he says, don't worry. This is me. This is because of the Holy Spirit. And here's what's so profound about that. God had chosen Joseph to be the adoptive father of Jesus. Jesus was going to grow in stature and in favor with God and men. That's what the scripture says. And God was seeing to it that the man who he had chosen to father Jesus in the, as a natural father, that he would be the one to raise him up by giving him a dream. That's really profound. And then we go on in Matthew, and we know that the wise men have seen a light in the sky. We know that they, they realize the significance of that. They tell Herod about it. Herod says, come report to me after it is that you, you know, discover what you discover. They go there, but we all know what Herod's intention is, right? <laughs> He's not happy. He's jealous about someone rising in prominence. And so they get a dream. And in the dream, the wise men are set, told, don't go report to Herod. So God is safeguarding the life of Jesus <laughs> through the revelation that's given in a dream. And then to further safeguard the life of Jesus, he tells Joseph, don't go back. <laughs> go to Egypt. Go settle there. Wait until there. Wait there until I come to you again. And Joseph obeys. He goes to Egypt. And then God comes again, speaks to him a dream, and he says, all right, it's time to go back. And they go to Galilee, and as a result of that dream, they settle in Nazareth. And here's what's profound about that. Not only is God safeguarding the life of Jesus, the revelation that's given in a dream, but he's also seen to it that there would be the fulfillment of biblical prophecy, and that is that the Messiah would come from Nazareth. That is really profound. Dreams are incredibly significant to God. And again, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now I want to share just about one theologian in history who also saw the prominence of dreams. His name is St. Thomas Aquinas. If you were to go to the um, seminary today, you would study his works. And St. Thomas Aquinas was a very prolific man. He wrote 21 volumes of books. They're called Summa Theologica, that means in Latin, the sum of all theology. Now, I can't even imagine the hours of research and diligence and prayer that went into those 21 volumes of books, and yet here's what happened at the end of his life. He has a vision at night. Remember Job 33, 
14 to 17, he has this vision, and at the end of the vision, he wrote these words. I can do no more. Such secrets have been revealed to me that all I have written now appears of little value. That's a very profound statement and speaks to the intensity of the dreams that we have or can have. So, how many hours on average do we sleep at night? Well, if you're a young parent, maybe four or five, <laughs> right? Or a student, maybe five or six, <laughs> who knows? But in general, over our lifetime, the hope is that we would sleep about eight hours a night, okay? That means that a third of our day is spent sleeping, right? So the first time I ever heard this, it was John Paul Jackson who said this. He said, so imagine this. You're 66 years old, and you've never paid attention to your dreams. You've lost out on the opportunity of 22 years of hearing from God at night. That's pretty profound. Because Job 33, 14 to 17 says he speaks at night. Now, that's not to communicate any condemnation or any shame if you've never paid attention to your dreams because the amazing thing about our God is he restores the years that the locusts have eaten. So if you've never paid attention to your dreams, now's the time to start paying attention to them. Don't worry about what you've not paid attention to in the past. Just know that there is a third of your day where you can choose at night when you go to bed, Father, I am open wide and I want to agree with Job 33, 14 to 17 and I want to say, please just help me catch those things that you're doing at night because when you do them, you want to turn me to your plans because that's what it says. God may speak in one way or another, yet man does not perceive it. Now, I just want to highlight a few things from this verse. Obviously, it says that he's speaking at night, right? But then it says, yet man does not perceive it. So, how many of you have had a dream at night, you wake up in the morning, and you're like, I know that was powerful, but I don't get it. Man does not perceive it. <laughs> how many of you have woken up in the morning, you know that you've had a dream, but you cannot remember it, and you're really frustrated because you feel like it was powerful? Man does not perceive it. <laughs> that doesn't mean that you'll never understand it. It just means that there are things that happen at night that God is doing that we don't have perception of. But guess what? He can increase our perception. And we're going to talk about that in just a minute. So when deep sleep falls upon men, why does he do this? Why does he speak to us at night? This dream says he seals his instruction inside of us. So what he's doing while we're sleeping, and he's depositing from heaven, from his heart, from his spirit, to our heart, to our spirit, what he desires for us. And then the verse goes on to say, in order to turn man from his deed. If he's turning us away from our deed, whose deed is he turning us towards? His. He conceals pride from us. And then again, if you go on to verse 18, it says, to keep, us, keep our souls back from the pit to keep us from perishing by the sword. So he does this so that we would be turned towards him, towards his plan, towards his will, which is absolutely amazing to me. So let's look now at some of the purpose and the function of dreams. So pretty amazing things when we start looking at this. One of the first things in the scriptures is in Genesis 20, verse 3. One of the reasons why he gives us dreams is to warn us about possible sin to keep us from doing it. And if you remember this story um, in Genesis, God warns Abimelech not to sleep with Sarah in this dream. So Sarah has been given to Abimelech. For whatever reason, she's not, he is not told that she is married to Abraham. And in a dream, God comes and he warns him and he says, don't sleep with her. She's married. So he's keeping her from sin. So I'm going to try to give, not examples for every single one of these, but this is one that I want to give an example to. Too. I was 19 years old. I'd been to school for a year already, freshman year of college, and I had a warning dream about returning to the university, to, back to CU. And in the dream, I don't need to go through it all, but basically I saw what was going to happen if I was to return. 
And when I woke up from the dream, I knew that it was a warning dream. And here's why I had to receive it in a dream. In my family, um, we were expected, to, you know, when we graduated from high school, we were going to go to college for four years, and we were either going to get a job right after that, or we were going to get a master's degree. And there was sort of no bones about it. And I needed God to speak, I, I, God needed to speak to me in order to bypass that rationale, right? And the great thing was, is that because I had heard him in dreams all my life, when I went to my mom and I said, Mom, I had this dream, and I think, I think God's given me a warning about going back there. She listened to the dream, she listened to the interpretation, and even though, honestly, in our house, it was a cardinal sin to not go to college, she was like, you know what, that's God. And I didn't go. I ended up taking two years off. It was totally God. I did go back to school, but I took heed to the warning. You're going to receive warning dreams, or you can receive warning dreams from God. He also gives us dreams to prophesy his will. Genesis 28. So Jacob has, Jacob has a dream about a ladder, and there's angels ascending and descending on it. And when he wakes up, God speaks to him that the land that he's lying on was um, that it would be his and his descendants and that all the people would be blessed through them. So sometimes you're going to receive dreams about God prophesying his will for your life. And I'll, I just want to say this. One of my, one of my almost... Um, one of the prayers I pray most often is, Father, would you give me a soft will towards your will? Because there are things that he speaks to us at night. There are things that he speaks to us in other forms of revelation that are going to reveal the things of our heart that aren't in alignment with his. And I remember when I was, um, I used to work in corporate America, God started speaking to me about uh, working in ministry, and I knew that there was a call on my life for it, but when he first started speaking to me he, about going into ministry, he wanted me to move, or I was receiving revelation about moving from Colorado, where I lived, to LA. Now, I love Colorado. I never wanted to leave Colorado. I was, um, you know, I was ready to, like, live the rest of my life there, have my children there, have a burial plot there. I never wanted to leave at this season of my life, and not only that, I'd been to LA, and I had once sworn, I will never live in LA. Um, how many of you know, never say never, because <laughs> God calls you on it. <laughs> and in a dream, one of the dreams I had was a guy that I was going to, you know, the guy that I ended up working for came to me in a dream. He laid his hands on my hands, and he just said, Janine, you're going to be working for me. Now, I didn't just move to L.A. on one dream. There were many, many pieces of revelation that I had about going to work for him. I submitted them to people who were speaking into my life, but I had many dreams that prophesied God's will. And what was so wonderful about hearing it in dreams is like every single one sort of chipped away at my will, you know, in the good way. Because God will never violate our free will. It's a gift that he's given us. And through dreams, he softened my heart towards what it is that he had for me. He also gives us dreams to show us the future and to prepare us for it. In Genesis 37, Joseph has a dream about his brothers, sheaves of grain bowing down to him, and you know, it preparing him for his eventual rule. I can only imagine, I don't know for sure, but if I had been Joseph in prison, I would have looked back to that dream to help me as I was in prison. So he does things in order to help us walk through what it is that we're doing in the future. In Genesis 40, we see the butlers and the bakers' dreams prophesying the future. Genesis 41 and 42, we see Pharaoh's dreams about Egypt. Daniel 2 and 4, we see Nebuchadnezzar's dreams about his future. So he shows us the future to prepare us for it. He also speaks in dreams to encounter us in really personal ways. This happens in 1 Kings 3. And he comes to Solomon, he encounters him at night, and he says, Solomon, what is it that you want? Solomon asks for wisdom, and it's his really personal encounter. So there are times when God is going to come to you at night just to encounter you, to engage with you, to converse with you, to give us encouragement. Judges 7, God gave Gideon the encouragement he needed. I already talked about that one. He also speaks things to our rational mind, or you know, speaks things to our spirit that our rational mind cannot understand. That's Matthew 1 again. Remember, God speaks to Joseph. <laughs> Joseph doesn't get it. How is it that Mary is pregnant? And he, keep, he bypasses the rational mind so that the spirit and the heart can catch what it is that he is saying. He also gives us dreams to give us clear direction sometimes. So while dreams can be highly metaphorical, many of them are, there are some times, like Joseph, you're going to be like, go to Egypt, go back to Nazareth, to the wise men, don't go back and report to Herod. So there's clear direction that we can receive at night. So 
With all of this, with all of these, you know, the purpose and the function, we see what's happening in these dreams. If if God speaks this way in the scriptures and we know that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, and he's, he's still doing that, why is it that our dreams are so illogical? Why is it that they're irrational sometimes? Why is it that they're enigmatic? Why is it that we sometimes don't get it? Why is it that you have a dream where pigs are running through a town? And, you know, why is it? Well... Sometimes God conceals things from us. But in Proverbs 25, 2, it says, it's the glory of God to conceal a matter. It's the glory of kings to search out the matter. Now, God sometimes is very, very clear in how he speaks to us. He sometimes is very, very clear in how he speaks through dreams. But sometimes he gives us these dreams that are highly symbolic that we cannot understand. And he doesn't do it because he doesn't want you to get it. He does it because he wants you to search him out. (laughs) He does it because he is more concerned about drawing you into intimacy with him than he is in anything else. When he gives you something that you don't understand, it's because he wants you to pursue him so that you will seek and find. So, even though he sometimes speaks in these hidden ways, here's what's amazing. He gives us tools in the scripture to help us understand. He doesn't leave us without instruction. We turn to the word in order to understand these things. It's called the language of the spirit. The language of the spirit is a language that we see in this precious, precious word of God. And all throughout the Old Testament and all throughout the New Testament, he speaks in symbols and metaphors and puns. And I'm going to give you just a few examples of that. When you look to Jeremiah, We see Jeremiah with the potter and the clay. And the Lord speaks to Jeremiah and he says, go down to the potter's house to see what I'm going to say. And he's watching the potter. And as he's watching the potter, the word of the Lord comes to him as he's looking at it. Now, how many of you have heard, you know, God's a potter, we're the clay? That's a metaphor, right? What does that mean? That means that God is the one who who creates us. That means God is the one who works in our lives. When you look at a potter, what do they have to have? They have to have water. What's that? The Holy Spirit. To keep us malleable in God's hand, he's going to pour out the Holy Spirit on us. You know, when a potter throws a pot, it's not perfect the first time. There are impurities that need to be worked out of it. That's metaphorical for sin in our lives. So you look at that picture. It's symbol and metaphor. We look at the almond branch. Now, this is a pun. In Jeremiah, that verse right there, Jeremiah, um, we see that um, not only does God speak in symbols and metaphors, but sometimes he makes word plays. And unfortunately, most of us don't catch it because most of us don't study the word in the Hebrew or the Greek. But in this passage here, here's what happens. The the, um, word of the Lord comes to Jeremiah and it says this. What do you see, Jeremiah? And Jeremiah responds, I see the branch of an almond tree. And the Lord says to me, you've seen correctly, for I'm watching to see that my word is fulfilled. Now, how many of you ever read that passage and wondered, why does an almond branch represent watching to see that my word is fulfilled? Well, here it is as a pun. What do you see, Jeremiah? I see a socket. Hmm. The Lord says to me, you've seen correctly, for I am so kid to see that my word is fulfilled. He's making a word play. What does that mean? That means sometimes in your dreams, yep, you're gonna see symbols and metaphors, but sometimes you're gonna see puns. I once had a dream where I was actually on the beach. I was looking out in the middle of the ocean. I knew that there was great anticipation for what was about to happen. Two huge whales come jumping out of this SeaWorld Park that's in this turquoise blue ocean. They land, they make a big splash, ripple waves go everywhere. They go into a holding tank, they come back down, and I hear an angelic voice in the dream say, the gates have yet to be released. And when I had this dream interpreted, someone said this, you're gonna be a part of two huge moves of God that make a great impact in the realm of the spirit on many, many people. The gates have yet to be released, but when it happens, you're gonna see the world. (laughs) Sea world, S-E-A, became see world, see the world, S-E-E. Why can you do that? Why is that biblical? Because if God speaks in puns in the scripture, he can speak in puns in your dreams. So, make room for that. Then we go to the New Testament. And in the New Testament, we see Jesus. You know, Jesus is teaching us 
through parables. He's teaching us principles of the kingdom. Jesus is perfect theology. Jesus could have argued with all of the scribes. He could have, he could have come and he could have given us a very mental understanding of you know, what the kingdom is like. And instead, he gives us very simple language. And he shows up and he talks about the mustard seed. Kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. He says to the woman at the well, I'm the living water. Then he's speaking to others. I'm the light of the world. And he talks about fish and he talks about figs and he talks about trees. And he's trying to help them understand through things that they know in life what the kingdom of God is like. And guess what? He does the same thing in your dreams. Dreams are just night parables. They're just night parables. And if we can understand and embrace this, you know, that God speaks in symbols and metaphors and puns, and we apply that principle to our dreams, we can start to understand them. Just the way that I shared with you about hearing the Holy Spirit, about listening to someone as they give a dream, we can engage with the Holy Spirit and we can realize, oh gosh, this language that you have, you can give this to me. I can understand the pictures that I'm seeing. Now here's the amazing thing. This language of the Spirit It's the same language of the Spirit that comes in all the other forms of revelation. So how many of you hear God, see God, you know, see things for other people? You see images, you see pictures. Raise your hand. Okay? It's mental pictures and imagery. Those are some of the ways that God speaks. So I don't know about you, but prior to studying this language, I would have pictures for people, but I couldn't interpret them. I could have a sense, maybe, of what God was doing, but I didn't really get how to say, gosh, I've seen, you know, this pot, and I've seen a tree grow up in it, and I'm not entirely sure what that means. Well, guess what? When you start studying the language of the Spirit, those things start to make sense to you. So, what do we want to do? Let's look first at Judges 7, 9 to 15. This is the dream that encouraged Gideon. So I just want to show to you in the word, this is how dreams are interpreted. In this particular verse, again, I referred to it earlier. The Lord says to Gideon, go down to the camp. You know, I've delivered it into your hand, but if you're afraid, go hear this dream. And here's the dream. So this is one man speaking to another. The first one says, I've had a dream. To my surprise, a loaf of barley bread tumbled into the camp of Midian. It came to a tent and it struck it so that it fell and overturned and the tent collapsed. And here's what his friend says. This is nothing else but the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel. Into his hand, God has delivered Midian and the whole camp. So how is it that he got the interpretation? Well, What did Gideon do for a living? What did he do for a living? He ground wheat. Why do you grind wheat? For bread, (laughs) right? In order to make bread. So here you have this loaf of bread. The loaf of bread has come to the tent. It's caused it to collapse. And the man understands that bread is a symbol for Gideon. The Midianites are going to fall to Gideon's sword. Do you see it? Now, does the loaf of bread, is it always going to mean Gideon? No. In this dream, it meant Gideon. But what else do we see bread being in the scripture? Jesus, the word of God, provision, right? Those are all different symbols for bread. So when you look, and not just at this biblical example, if you take what I'm teaching you here tonight and you look at the dreams that we have in Scripture, you're going to see this language come alive to you. And I want to encourage you, it's language that you can learn. When you embrace the fact that God speaks in dreams and you understand that they are night parables, you can look to the Word so that you can start to get how is it that God speaks this way. In the, in dream, in the Scripture, dream interpretation is given in two forms. One by revelation, so you pray, you hear the Holy Spirit, and that's awesome. All interpretations belong to God, it's revelation. But we also see in Daniel, at this really powerful verse, it says this, as for these four men, God gave them knowledge and skill in all literature and wisdom. Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Is understanding instantaneous? No, understanding is something that you grow in. And I want to bless you to know you can grow in understanding the language of the Spirit. 
You can grow in being able to understand symbols, metaphors, and puns. You can grow in being able to understand your dreams. It's all gonna come from the Holy Spirit. You're always gonna turn to him, but you can partner with him by looking at your dreams and interpreting the dreams of others, and you can actually grow in your ability to do this, and it's a powerful, powerful, powerful thing. So what are some keys to unlocking the meaning of your dreams? Well, first of all, if you are gonna um, unlock the meaning of your dreams, you're gonna need to remember them, right? (laughs) You're going to need to remember them. First thing I want to encourage you to do, go to sleep at night, ask God to speak. Ask him to give you dreams. Ask him to give you visions. Ask him to help you know when he's speaking. Ask him to wake you up at the best time when you're going to be able to remember it. Now let me just give you a warning. It's not always just before your alarm clock. (laughs) Oh, how I wish it was. (laughs) But here's what happens when you, when you have the Holy Spirit wake you up, and you respond, essentially what you're telling him is, I value what you speak. I wanna take time to listen to you. I wanna take time to engage with you about the dreams that you give me or the dreams that I've had that you can give me wisdom on that don't come from you. And then you wanna record them. How many of you have had the experience where you wake up in the morning and you're like, oh my gosh, I had a powerful dream and by two o'clock in the afternoon it's totally gone. As closer you can to writing it down early in the morning the better off you're gonna be. These are very practical things to do. But most importantly, what I wanna do is I wanna encourage you to turn to the word. (laughs) Turn to the word. (laughs) Study the parables that are found in the New Testament. We have many, many parables for which we have the interpretation. Study the dreams, study the visions. We have a dream and we have an interpretation. We have a vision and we have an interpretation. The more that you familiarize yourself in the word of God, in the, in the ways that God speaks like this, the more you're gonna catch the language of the spirit in your own dreams and your own visions and your own pictures. I don't wanna bless you in the name of Jesus to walk into that journey with the Holy Spirit as your friend, with the Holy Spirit as your counselor, who will teach you the ways of God when it comes to interpreting your dreams and your visions. Would you stand?